Okay, now how are we? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> I can hear myself echoing. <laughs> um, okay, lovely. Now, I just want, I want you to stand up right now if you loved playing in the forest, on the beach, by a river, in the lake when you were a kid. Stand up. <laughs> okay, so we're looking at pretty much 100% of the room. You can sit back down now. <laughs> Interestingly, that is one feature that is pretty much consistent in everyone who invests time in restoration and conservation as an adult. Enjoying and loving nature as a kid is a key predictor. Now, I've asked this question at a lot of different forums now from um, uh, a Law Society review, for example, that I spoke at. Now, I had about 20% of the room stand up. Of course, we're talking at, at, at a restoration day today, so I expected that I'd probably get most of you. But it really highlights that connecting people with nature as a child, but also as an adult, is a key way that we can convert this population to become environmental stewards. Now, what I wanted to talk about today is that transition for me. I mean, just heard a little bit about my bio, but what I hope to do, to you, do for you today is take you through a few different stories for me that were quite transitional, that convinced me that working on ecology and animals is fantastic and important, but it's all about people. <coughs> So I was lucky enough to study down in Dunedin. I focused on zoology when I was a youngster, did my masters and so forth. And I was really focused on, for example, creating more habitat for shearwaters or finding novel ways like road bridges uh, to reduce the effects of fragmentation on species like the yellow-throated scrub ring. Now, don't be uh, uh, scared that you don't recognise that species. It is an Australian rainforest passeron. So I really worked, I, I was an ecologist, I was a zoologist. I didn't really like people, to be honest. <laughs> I found it much easier to work on birds, much easier to work on animals. They didn't talk back, they didn't confuse me, and so forth. I was a, I was a classic introvert. But as I went along, I really realised that it's great to have the science, but you know what? It's all about people. My first... Uh, real discovery in this space was when I got this role for the Queensland government. So for anyone who doesn't know where Queensland is, there's a little map down in the corner. But it's an incredible place. It's very diverse from the tropical rainforests over on the east coast through to the deserts of the west part of the state. So it's an amazing place, amazing biodiversity. But it does absolutely rubbish in protected areas. To give you some context, the global average in terms of protected land across the world is about 14%. So it's the average amount of each country that's been put aside for conservation. New Zealand's doing a bit better, 32%, the place where we don't do so well is all the rest of the landscape, of course. But we're sitting amazingly on, on, on a global scale for protected areas. Australia on average is at 17% and Queensland, one of the only places in the world which is still in single, single digits. 4% of Queensland in protected areas. So my job in the Queensland government was to lead a team that needed to double the protected area state. So it was a huge project. You know, we had to go about finding the money, doing all the science to increase that protection, etc. Of course, there is a lot of science behind developing a really world-class protected area estate. One of the key things that you need to go for is representation of different ecosystems. So, for example, up in that top area, the, uh, the Cape York area, also the wet tropics, they do pretty well, more than 15%. That's above that global average number. So that includes, of course, the Daintree Rainforest, some of these places with the most spectacular mammalian diversity that you'd ever see in your life, the possums, the little rats and so forth, <laughs> through down to, down to the um, Lissy's butterfly, which is, um, you know, some amazing invertebrates as well. So they do pretty well at protection of this sort of spectacular, you know, world-class UNESCO type site. Don't do quite as well down in places like the Inersley uplands, desert uplands. So there's places that have these big wooded plains. 
um, but also the Brigolo belt. So that's Brigolo uh, up in that top image. And one of New Zealand's uh, most infamous exports, Joe Biaki Pearson, who led Queensland for a while, uh, basically put in some pretty remarkable policies that led to the absolute destruction of this quite incredible landscape. So he actually um, um, put in place lovely little incentives to go and clear as much brigolo as you could. <laughs> So anyway, it's, it doesn't do so well in the protected area state, but in these sorts of places you get the hairy nosed wombat, get some pretty sweet as scorpions, you know, some pretty cool things in these um, areas. Where they are doing particularly poorly, less than 2% in protection is these places called the Mitchell Grass Downs. Amazing landscapes, seasonally, the water comes through every five years or so, massive downfall. And you just get these like, this is a flock of budgies. Like absolutely amazing, um, you know, increasing life all at once from what it looks originally like a big dry, grassy or barren plain. So these places are pretty poorly protected. There's a lot of difficulty in protecting these landscapes in part because these guys are nomadic. So a lot of the bird species in the, er the area move around a lot. So how do you develop a protected area system to protect a nomadic species. It's highly complicated, but we came up with a pretty good um, set of solutions that include both private protected areas, so working with landholders, and also the, um, the, of course, the national protected area state. So we use these principles, you know, representation, picking up amazing uh, patches of bush. I got to helicopter and fly across most of that, that state. Um, to select out which areas we wanted to put in, in reserve. Now, about three years into my role, we had an election. So uh, we had a fairly green, it wasn't completely green government before, um, while I was doing this work. But almost overnight, a government was elected in that had a very public policy about actually not just not expanding the National Park Estate, <coughs> but reducing it. This government got in, and so within four days, I was asked to absolutely halt this program, but then also identify what national parks we could degazette, so downgrade the protection. It was a bit confronting for me as a conservation biologist, pretty full on, but I think it was the very first realization for me. I went, oh my gosh, the ecology is great, but it's about the people. Queenslanders, the people who voted this government in, they knew this was one of the policies, but it was not important to them at the time. You know, of course, there are a lot of other things that we need to worry about, but the, the environment was so far down on that priority list that this happened. So I think the key thing for us as conservationists, as people who value our environment, we need to be thinking about the people the website people. That's me. <laughs> it's cool, don't worry about it. Um, right, so what I was going to show up there is the world population clock. So we're currently at, oh there it is. <laughs> Ta-da. <laughs> so we're currently at 7.6 billion people and counting. Look at how fast that's going up. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's night somewhere, eh? <laughs> anyway, um, so this, this is, a, it's very easy as, an, as a person who values the environment to look at this in panic, you know? I look at this in panic most of the time, but I've started to look at this in a different way. This is the number of people that we need to convert into environmental stewards. <laughs> So the key question is how we go about doing that. Okay, so, lovely, thank you all. <coughs> Pointing it the wrong way, <laughs> probably. There we go. Okay, so what are, as I mentioned, so we've had one story about Queensland. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little about a couple of other places across the world that I've worked and really highlight that transition from, okay, the ecology is important, but it's all about people. Now, I was lucky enough as a, as a younger person to work for the Smithsonian Institute. I was there for several years, and they did fly me across the globe into some of the coolest places on the planet 
to work in uh, restoration or conservation. So one of the places I worked was Myanmar or Burma. Now, obviously you can see it's sort of Southeast um, Asia influence in that country, but very diverse culturally. So lots of different groups of people come together in this place. Now, my work in this area focused on the Asian elephant. So the Asian elephant is endangered. It's um, particularly in Myanmar, in Myanmar is highly threatened, especially by habitat loss and a range of other factors. The place I worked is this green area that you can kind of see in the middle. Is there a laser? Yeah, there we go. So this green area that you can see in the middle of Myanmar is called the Bagoyama Forest. Now it's an interesting area, it's actually all mostly highland, but around it you can see all of this type of area is covered by uh, rice paddies, other um, agricultural industries and also urbanisation. So it's quite an isolated patch, but it is rather significantly large. Now it's got quite a large population of elephants, it's roughly 100 or so when I was there, which for elephants it's a lot of elephant, if you put them all together in a room. But they're threatened primarily by habitat loss. Now I mentioned this earlier, but that area had remained sort of quite intact because it was highland, because there wasn't a lot of industry that was moving into those places. Now while I was there, the government had a big push um, to recapture some of these areas for industry, in particular for rubber farming. So that meant that there was a bit of a shift in industry from the rice paddies and the other uh, flat areas to actually removing habitat from these highlands, these remnant highlands. Now, what we were finding is as a result of that, we were seeing these elephants coming out into these human dominated landscapes. So for example, uh, animals would come out, they'd rampage, they'd look through the kitchen bins to try and find a bit of food, and people were coming into contact with them. And it was a very serious problem. So the one on the left, that's a, um, that's a rich person's version of a um, shelter, a place where you go to get away from the elephants. And they'd spend a fair bit of time up there, and these guys were lucky because they'd have servants that would run around and give them food up from that uh, rope pulley bucket. <laughs> However, of course, it affected everyone differently, and this is a, a, a small family group that was nomadic and so, uh, lived in a subsistence way, and they had this tiny little... Um, uh, basically a platform up in the tree and that family including those little kids there had just spent two weeks up in that platform and just sending someone down to dash for food every now and then with this threat of elephants coming through seasonally. So it was really changing how people live, it was a big impact. Now the key approach to dealing with this was to go and capture as many of the wild elephants as possible and domesticate them. So domestic elephant is a highly valuable thing and it's important for logging, it's important for farming, etc. So there's quite a big domestic herd in Myanmar. But the problem with this approach is it was a one-way street. So animals were coming from the wild, and basically we were ending up with no population in the wild. Coupled with that is that there wasn't a lot of breeding of elephants in captivity. So we weren't actually seeing that replenishing of the domestic herd population. So, me and my naivety, I went in and I thought, okay, it must be, protected area must be the solution here. You know, it's all about the animals, it's all about the ecology, let's fence it all off and, you know, uh, see how we go. However, we did a lot of work while we were there, um, in particular, catching, catching, tracking elephants to, sit, to um, examine their movements. We also did a lot of work with the people, so trying to understand the, the full severity of this problem and, and what it meant for people. So out there you can see, um, this is a, oops, wrong way. Oh, can I go back? Oh, there we go. So what you can see out there is that that's a GPS collar for an elephant. Now taking that through customs in Myanmar <laughs> in 2004 was <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Um, but what, basically what we did is we capture a wild um, elephant, aim for the matriarch, and then track her around the forest to try and identify the herd's movements. And there we are, um, tracking the elephants, basically. Now what we found while we were there is that these elephants were making very seasonal movements. So they were following the vegetation as it became richer in different parts of that forest. So effectively we were seeing movements from the north to the south, 
the north in the rainy months and the south in the dry months. Now interestingly, we coupled that of course with the social research that we were doing at the time. We found that our, the, the small subsistence groups of people, the families, were making almost identical movements. So, not, so it's not rocket science, it's absolutely obvious as to why these two groups were coming into conflict. However, what we were able to do is to simply communicate this information to young people in schools. So we took this information into the tiny little community schools that were spread across this region. Now these kids really got on board with this. They really value the elephants. They, they do think that they're an incredibly special thing to have in the wild, and seeing them decline in the wild was particularly patent to these group of people. These kids took this information to their parents and were able to see that protected areas indeed weren't the solution. Oh, sorry, you're probably not hearing half of what I can say. Consider yourself lucky. <laughs> Here we go, is that a bit better? Down here? How's that? How's that? I'll try and not move as much. My toes are a bit warmer now. So indeed, protected areas weren't the solution. Instead, we were able to work with that local community to reduce the forest felling. So that includes, of course, reducing the number of rubber farms that were going in, but also by providing more efficient cooking stoves to simply reduce the amount that people were needing to use on a day-to-day -day basis. We also were also able to work with people to look at slight shifts in movements so that they weren't exactly overlapping with where the elephants were needing or wanting to be. And coupled with this project was a big effort to improve captive rearing of the domestic herd. So that simply meant that not as many animals were needed to be brought from the wild into domestic um, service. That animal there was the first little baby born in about 20 years in the domestic herd. It's pretty cute. So that, that experience for me was incredible. It really showed how motivated people were to actually be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And that information sharing, just having knowledge and sharing that knowledge with young people is a key approach that you can take to bring people on board and convert them into environmental stewards. What am I doing for time? Pretty good, okay. So the next story that I was quite keen to talk to you about today was the Schwalski horse translocation that I was part of um, as part of this program as well. So we're sort of moving across the globe here from Southeast Asia up to the steppes of Mongolia. Is this working all right now? A bit better? Yeah, cool. So up to the steppes of Mongolia and China. So originally the Schwalski horse uh, distribution was massive, absolutely massive. So, you know, it was a, a species, an ungulate, that hung around in herds and just roamed the plains in a very nomadic way. Again, a very difficult species to fit into that very narrow approach of protected areas. Now, the species was actually only described in 19, uh, sorry, 1881. It's very distinct and it's the only remaining true wild horse. So it's very stocky looking if you haven't seen one. It's got you know, a little mane that sticks up, it's kind of cool, um, but it's also very hard to domesticate. So in the zoos, they actually have a lot of trouble with this species, you know, keeping it um, um, in captivity. But it was very appealing. It was a, a bit of a symbol of status, and there was a big push from Europe um, to capture as many as possible for zoos in about the 1900s. They did an incredibly good job of capturing these animals, and in 1969, the very last wild horse was sighted. So they were finally designated as extinct in the wild in 1992 by the IUCN. Now, interestingly, people were the cause of the problem. However, the zoos and people were the cause of the solution for the species. Classic scenario in conservation. So as a result of this effort to capture the animals in captivity, 13 animals were used to start a new population that was destined for release. So in 1945, those 13 horses in captivity were used to be bred up, you know, classic genetics, making sure brothers didn't meet with, you know, mate with sisters and so forth. It's all very complicated. But it led to the first reintroduction into the wild in 1992. 
So the area that I worked was near Urumqi in northern China in the Kalamaili Nature Reserve. So the local people were incredibly interested to bring this very charismatic, very special species back to the steppes. And my job was all about trying to find exactly the right place for these guys. So there's a few different factors that we need to consider. So for example, we need to make sure that there's enough uh, fodder for them when it's snowy, but also that there's enough water to access. In these big places, you can't just go and visit and pick out a spot or use satellite imagery and so forth. So that was my key role originally. It's finding the best spot for reintroduction. However, we got out there and we did do this magnificent reintroduction. It was one of the highlights of my career seeing uh, these guys bolt out of these giant containers having been shipped from Europe and, and sort of released into this soft release pen. But we were absolutely doomed for failure to begin with. So one of the key things that hadn't been considered in this project is that local, um, local involvement in the local people. We were able to do that while we were there. So we could sit at our desks all along and do all the satellite mapping that we liked and do all the planning that we liked. But it wasn't until we got there they were actually able to engage with the local people and ensure they were on board. And this was critical because this species can interbreed with normal horses, resulting in a hybrid that, is, that can be sterile and in fact is terrible for the species. So when we, when we finally got there, we basically took a step back from the program and we're able to give it over to the local people and say, here, make some decisions about how you want to monitor the species and what you want for the species in the future. It was incredibly empowering. And that program today has grown to involve multiple different families, multiple different nomadic groups, and they're insanely interested in making sure that species stays there in the long term. So that species went from being extinct in the wild in 1992 critically endangered when it was still taking a very narrow, almost Western science comes in and reintroduces a species approach, to involving the local people and moving into an endangered status in 2011. So you can see that's on an upwards trajectory. So there's, several, there's about five populations of this species now in that region. So it's doing rather well and I think it can only go from strength to strength from here. Okay, so I'm going to circle back around. Still doing okay for time, I think. Yep. Cool, circle back around. We've heard a lot. Hopefully I've convinced you, if you weren't already convinced, that conservation is not about the animals, it's about the people. It's about the people. People cause the problem. People solve the problem. It's all about people. So my research focus shifted entirely about six years ago. Look, I love that, love the animals. You know, I still get to, to, to do that kind of thing up at Zealandia, of course. But I'm interested in the psychology behind why we engage with nature, what that means for us, and how we bring more people on board. So, back to the central question, how do we turn 7.6 billion people into environmental stewards? In fact, let's make it a little bit simpler. New Zealand, 4.7 million. So maybe a slightly easier task. We have a few challenges to overcome. We have less and less space for nature in our lives. Almost 100% of New Zealanders now live in cities. That's crazy. And just over half of that 7.6 billion people live in cities now. They are some of our most nature depauperate places on earth. That's also changing, interestingly. I, I, I show this slide quite a lot because for me it just brings something home. This is a suburb that was designed in the early 1900s. And you can see each of those houses sits on about 30% of the lot that it's built on. Okay, it leaves quite a lot of space for your big old backyard trees, you know, your shrubs, whatever else you'd like around your house, your lawn, even. Fast forward to a suburb built in the 2000s. These, on average, and I sat there and calculated this for about 500 houses, <laughs> sit on about 80% of the lot that they sit on. Of course, it completely changes the space, the trees, the places for play that kids have nowadays. So our cities themselves are changing. Not only are more people moving into cities, but our cities look different. 
So, councillor, if you have a chance to influence this, you've got to use the chance, don't you? <laughs> the other scary thought is we don't just have less space for, for nature, we have less time for nature. Children, New Zealand children, spend on average 50 hours a week in front of screens. Like, that's incredible. It's more time than I hope to spend at work at any one week. No, so, so really, that just it leaves you with a lot less time for nature in your lives. And nature is such a rich learning tool. You can learn mathematics, you can learn science, you can learn art. You can learn the full suite of subjects from nature. So this trend, I think it's one of the ones that we perhaps most need to reverse in our society. So my research has shown that almost half of us don't get out into green space in any week. So a classic day is you get in a car, you drive to work, you do your work, you know, spend eight hours sitting at your desk, you might pop down to the shop at lunchtime to get a soup or something, and then you get back in your car, you drive home, you do it all in reverse, and then you sit in front of TV for a few hours. Now, that is a classic day for a lot of people. You know, we are the lucky ones who get to spend a lot more time out there, but it's almost half of the population, so around 40%. It's a heck of a lot of people who in any one week don't spend any time in nature. <laughs> so this is termed the extinction of experience. This fellow, Richard Louvre, actually coined that phrase back in 1978. So it was a long time ago. So people have been worried about this for actually quite a long time. This, this, so, so this extinction of experience of nature is made up of the fact that we have less space for nature and less time for nature. And how can we value what we don't experience or understand? <sighs> Unfortunately, it's a whole lot more complicated than all of that, of course. There are a lot of barriers to actually achieving more space for nature and achieving more time for nature. So this is just a little a snapshot of research that shows in people's own backyards, there are a lot of other factors that influence whether they're even likely to plant a tree. In this example, you can see that people in the lowest, the most disadvantaged groups tend to have much lower tree cover than the highest, more advantaged groups. And this, is, uh, this result comes after taking into account backyard size and so forth. Now, there's a lot of reasons that this happens. There's preferences. I simply, maybe I just don't even want a tree in my backyard. It's fine. But also, there's uh, other barriers. You know, I've just bought a house up in Kotakota. I'm trying to fix up my backyard at the moment. It's costing me quite a lot of money. Because it's actually not cheap to go to, the, go to Bunnings or, or um, you know, of course, we've got our lovely nurseries up in Stokes Valley and so forth. But it costs a lot of money to go and actually buy enough plants to do something special with your backyard. So we have some real barriers for certain groups of our society to actually creating a nature-rich life. However, there are ways to overcome this kind of a trend. In fact, we find that pe even people in these uh, lower socioeconomic groups tend to be able to overcome these challenges if they grew up playing in nature, if they have that connection to nature, they love nature. So there are ways to overcome these kinds of trends. Now, another little interesting piece of research, we also looked at um, other barriers to nature. So, for example, attitudes towards the natural environment. In this case, this was an Australian study, as you can see by the angry looking fella sitting right there. It doesn't seem to be quite as concerning in, in New Zealand, but in Australia, these guys are <laughs> absolutely frightening. You know, they'll completely attack you when you're riding along your bike, um, you know, uh, nail your face. I know a little four year old actually lost his eyesight in one eye with the bird, like, nailed his eye. Cool. Um, so they, <laughs> cool. So, so they're a real concern for people. But we also see that people who spend less time in nature tend to fear it more. Of course, that makes sense. But we see this over time as well. So people who fear nature spend less time in it, and the effect gets cumulative. However, this can also be be overcome. So gradual introduction of people into this idea of nature, into small, safe nature experiences is absolutely critical, especially as a youngster, to reduce that fear. 
So of course there are a range of benefits that Prue uh, mentioned earlier on, health benefits of nature. We see a lot of good things that come out of connecting with the natural environment. We see reductions in mental fatigue and stress. Reductions in blood pressure, quite measurable. Almost, you could actually achieve almost as much for the population if you got everyone to spend half an hour in, in nature a week as you could if you actually got their BMIs into the normal range. That's quite um, remarkable but also reductions in cardiovascular disease and, and mortality. Now, on the other hand, spending time in nature, we've got marked improvement in cognitive function and mental health, but also social well-being, and that's particularly important as we grow older, and also higher levels of physical activity if you spend more time in nature. So, is the solution to provide more space for nature or increase time for nature? Well, I say it's probably not. These things are important, but there's a whole lot of other things that we can do. Spending time in nature and having more of it is not enough. We need active engagement. That includes through what you're doing, through restoration, through connecting with the community, through restoration is absolutely critical. We also need to make sure we're connecting people from different social groups so that our groups aren't just made up of the same faces every time. And we also need to try and connect with people who aren't really interested. If you can get only one person along to your restoration group who ordinarily wouldn't engage, you're doing incredible things for the environment, perhaps even more so if you're getting people along who do normally engage. And of course, connect with young people. We all stood up at the beginning, we all loved nature as young people. This is the one thing that we can do to truly change our future, is bring young people along for the ride. So that's it. Thank you very much. I'll leave you there. <laughs>